Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 302, featuring the final installment of my interview with Dr. Richard Bartle, the co-creator of MUD, the progenitor of today's MMORPGs like World of Warcraft. This part of the interview, we talk some more about the advantages of that text interface, uh, where the MMORPG needs to go in the future, and also clear up some uh, common misconceptions about the inspirations behind MUD. A lot of great stuff here, and I know you will enjoy it very much, so without further ado, here is Dr. Richard Bartle. You know, I've been doing some research lately into uh, Colossal Cave and Zork and, you know, the whole Infocom thing. And yeah. I know that they faced a lot of challenges when the graphical adventure games started to come out, and they, I guess, they mm. kind of held to their guns for a while. And I was wondering what it was like for you, you know, as the MMOs, or the MUDs, I guess, started to add on graphical elements, Ultima Online, Meridian, was it Meridian 59, all these sorts of yeah. things. You know, how did you feel about those when they um, were first we came always out? Knew, we always knew that they were going to come. We'd been speaking about what we called graphical muds for years. We knew they were going to come. I mean, um, Island of Kesmai was basically a graphical mud. Okay, so the graphics it had was ASCII, square bracket, uh, so open square bracket, closed square bracket, that's a wall. You know, uh, tilde, tilde, that's water. So it, it did... We, we, we always knew that we were um, hamstrung by the um, modem speeds. We always knew how to do it. You would send a code down the line, which your computer at this end would um, interpret. But of course, that meant that you had to have the same computer. Computers then were, it wasn't like there was a PC standard um, that everybody used the PC. It would, um, if you had a Commodore um 64 or Amiga or something, or you had an Atari ST um, or BBC model B or a Spectrum. Yeah, they were all different. Each one of them was different. So we had to wait until the um, technology was available. And then it was a case of who can raise the money to do it. And we could never raise the money. Um, I, I couldn't raise the money. I'm not a business person. Um, and, the, and our business person that we did get got manic depression or um, bipolar disease, you call it nowadays, and shot himself dead. Yeah, Simon Daly. So um, we, we were never going to get it done. Um, so when they arrived, it was a case of, well, yeah, text is superior to graphics. However, graphics has the best first impressions. If you see text and you see graphics, you're always going to go for the graphics. So it doesn't matter that textual worlds and today you can play some textual worlds which are rich varied delightful emotional with far more content than you've got even in wow and like art wolf and bat mud and those yeah things like that yeah legend mud these are ones that have been going for ages and if you can use your imagination instead of looking at the, the um, screens you will get a better experience from them but you're not going to because you're looking at screens. That's why this is a visual thing and it's not a uh, me exchanging emails. You know, pictures um, have got a, a place. So although I personally regard text as being superior to graphics and graphics are just one step along the long road that's going to get us to text, um, that, that doesn't make any odds because players of computer games look at the graphics before they look at the text. Um, and in one sense, if you look at something and it's got lousy graphics, you know there's not spent a lot of money on it. So why would you th think that they'd spend any money on anything else? But um, if you play MMOs, you'll see after a while that all the monsters are actually the same monster. Um, you know, one murloc in World of Warcraft is the same as any other world of war, like murloc. It's just that some are bigger and they've got different textures on them but they're pretty much all murlocs. And one basilisk is the same as any other basilisk. They're, they're all the same. Um, and you've got a stock of um, monsters that you take out and repurpose. You might get the occasional differences for bosses that have been handcrafted. But in a text world, you can have many, many, many monsters you, you, because it's, it's so easy to add a new one. 
if you just, just it's, it's a line of text just describing the thing, and then what is it? Um, it's a it's a humanoid, um, a regenerating, uh, weak, um, good creature. Well, there you go, and I'll call it a, a sand troll or whatever. Or just give it my own name. It's it, it's um, you know, planet Zog alien. I mean, it doesn't matter. You can just create as, as many as you want uh, because you don't need to animate them. Some person's got to go and animate it if you create one of those things. And you're looking a month, two months away before it actually could be made. In a, in a text world, you can just make it on the fly. Um, and that makes it so much easier to add content. It needs a much more variety of content. And the other thing is that um, in a non-text world, on the screen, you have the um, the interface is buttons to click on. So you're limited by the number of buttons you can fit on a screen. But in a textual world, you're limited only by the vocabulary. You can have as many commands as you want. You can um, add um, shades to the commands. So... Um, yeah quickly pick up or or um and and i mean mud two's parser can handle things like a uh, pick up the smallest of the green swords and drop it in fred's bag you know it can do things like that uh most of the time people don't type that most of the time people type things like k z f l s kill zombie with long sword the reason they use f is because that's um, short for the pre preposition from um, and it's only one character whereas with is two characters because that's wi for with because w is west so, so they get kzfls kill zombie with long sword. e dot 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 meaning east one two three four five times so th those are the kind of commands that you get but if you ever do need to do something um if you wanted to open the door with the silver key, because you know the other keys are going to make the door explode, you would type open uh, or op door F or with um, silver key, and that would do it. Uh, but you can try also, and the number of emotions in MMOs that you've got. I mean, in, in mud, yeah. If you if you type lol in mud, then you laugh out loud. Now there's some MMOs that have got that, you know, laugh out loud, ha ha ha. But they always. Um, they they, all, they 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 don't let you um moderate it so um if i um salute if i type slash salute and it will sort of you know give you a salute or probably that way for american salute um but it doesn't let me say salute sarcastically in fact it may even impose upon me it may say you salute smartly no i didn't want to salute smartly i wanted to salute sloppily but you wouldn't let me you just assumed I was doing it smartly, but no. So these kind of nuances that you can get in the text world. And if someone's asleep and you lol, it should wake them up. You know, you just made a noise. Well, it would in the text world because they've got not noises. If, some, if you can't hear something because someone's uh, deafened your character, which never happens in modern MMOs, but in back then if um, your character could be deafened so they couldn't hear anything, but you might still see someone salute but you wouldn't hear them laugh, but you might see them laugh. But if, they, if it was just um, a noise, you wouldn't hear a bell in the distance. Um, all these um, like modal changes to characters by um, disabling particular sensory inputs or abilities, those, those are again things which you don't get in modern MMOs. It might be to do with political correctness, because um, you can see why having a character who's been blinded is a not going to go down well with people who actually are blind um, or who know people who are blind but then on the other hand if it's a game thing I mean I have a basilisk in mud which you can fight while blind but if you don't if you're not blind it's gonna you're gonna see it and turn to stone so um, yeah well, so but, but so something yeah, some things have moved on but others well why can't you <sighs> but why can't you just make these minor changes that were, we could do in the old days and they're so much different ah back to uh it, it sounds as though i'm reminiscing for the past and wanting the past but it's not i don't want the past what i want is the present further ahead 
And if it takes some of the things that we did in the past forward with it, well, it would have to do to advance. You've, um, you can't progress unless you've, you, you go with depth as well as breadth. And the depth is what we had in the past. So by making developers aware of these, well, the thing is they are aware of them because they played MUDs as well. They know about these things. It's just they've got to sell them to the players, they've got to implement them, they've got to design them, and there's somebody saying, this is costing $50 million, don't do anything stupid. So why take the risk? Mm. Yeah, that was one of the things we had. I mentioned that a, a documentary I watched called uh, Bedrooms to Billions, and mm -hmm. uh, that's a theme that comes up in there a lot about how the UK used to have this amazing games industry centered around, I guess, the, uh, the ZX yeah. and the Commodore 64, but that suddenly went away you know, once it sort of got taken over by Nintendo and, and Sega. But I'm just wondering, uh, you know, from your perspective, what impact do you think that MUD had on the UK uh, personal computer scene of the time, if, if any? Not a lot. Um, the, the reason the UK got so far ahead in games was because of the BBC Model B Micro, which was installed in every school. What do you do with a computer? Well, you write games on it, don't you? So that's what people did. And this was the, the, the BBC went to schools about 81, something like that. Um, so we had lots of kids who were writing games for these things. Um, some of them were rubbish. Some of them were good. Some of them, um, the people were uh, got lucky. Some of them had rich parents. Um, and they managed to get these games made and sold. And it was a... Um, it was kind of contained market because there weren't so many people with BBCs or Spectrums in other countries. And, and it, it worked, worked really well. Um, and to this day, the UK is still, I think probably about the fourth, maybe the fifth, um, biggest games developer in the world. What we're not good at in the UK though, well, we're very good at creativity. We're not good at exploiting it or funding it. So, um, if you want to um, set up your own company, uh, then the banks will give you money if you can show them in quite strong terms that you don't need it. <laughs> um, then they'll give you some. Um, but other than that, uh, you know, I don't know. So it's, um, we're good at creating things, but bad at exploiting them. And yes, um, the French bought a lot of our um, companies up move some things away um games have never been treated as um academically respectable or indeed any kind of respectable they're a lowbrow entertainment um when government money was ever put into games it was always into making the the equivalent of um well back in the 30s the uk had quite a good film industry but films were getting subsidized in other countries and the government decided that maybe we should subsidise our films, but because films are low-brow entertainment, why would we subsidise them? Let's make fil let's um, subsidise documentary making, and they put some money in, maybe kind of through the post office back then, um, which made documentaries. And Britain became really good at making documentaries. All these documentaries that you see, Life on Earth, and so on. Th that's a consequence of our long tradition in making documentaries. However, the British film industry for non-documentaries, um, well, Hollywood ate our lunch. Um, and it's similar with games. Um, we are great at making games, but if you want, say, in academic terms to develop games, then you, it's got to be serious games, which are like um, the equivalent of documentaries for games. And it's ridiculous. Um, other countries that have... Um, embracing games have got no problems. I mean, the Scandinavian countries are much smaller than the UK, but they outperform per head in games just because they see this as the future. Whereas in the UK, oh, games, yes. And I've been, I have been to cultural things talking about um, games, and they say, and I'm still hearing things like, um, do you ever think that um, games will be able to do um, emotion? Whenever you have a game that where someone will cry, permadeath, cry permadeath. That's what you you need to hear, mate. And yeah, so you still get these, and we've just got to wait for them to die. These people are going to die eventually, and once they've died, everybody who's grown up has played games. They understand games. They know games. We'll have better games, but 
old people have got to die first. Sadly, I'm getting to be an old person and will be dead uh, before I see this. So I'm kind of annoyed about that. But the it, it, things will change. It, but um, the UK had a we, we still punch above our weight. Um, you know, the US and Japan because they control the consoles and and the the um, and the, the consoles are where most of the action was until you know, fairly recently with Steam and so on. Um, the, the, the there's a big tradition there. And, and in America, famously, it doesn't matter how bad they think what you're doing is. If they think it'll make you money, you'll find someone who can give you money for it. And lots of money has been put into games. It comes in waves. You know, we have the dot-com boom and so on. But but um, the way venture capitalists in America think is um, if I invest in 10 companies and one of them makes it big, that's good. They expect to lose. Whereas in Britain, they don't want to bet on anything unless it's a sure bet. Um, so America, Japan, um, Canada, with its um, games um, subsidies, which took a whole lot of talent over from the UK to go to, go to Canada. Now South Korea, if it's not on the same as the UK, it's, um, it's, it's close, it's maybe overtaking. China again coming through, um, mainly rewriting games, or not even rewriting, just rebranding games. Um, but it's such a huge market that they're going to be um, going to be big. Lots of smaller countries trying to get in because they can see that there's a niche. Um, some that are not doing as well. Germany doesn't do as well as it should do. France doesn't do as well as it should do, even though it's got Ubisoft. Um, but they'll, they'll come. They'll come through eventually once the people who are complaining about oh you mustn't have blood on your screen die. Um, so it'll all come out, yes. Um, but the UK was quite an exciting time. We always, um, many of the people who played Mud went off and worked in the games industry. I mean, um, Jez San, who formed a company called Argonaut, he was Jez the Wizard in Mud. He wasn't called Jez before, really, before he got here to, into Mud. That's short for Jeremy, if you ever wanted to know. But yeah, he got an OBE. Um, I nominated him for it, but he still got it. That's the point. Um, and you, things things like um, DirectX was invented in the UK twice. Um, one of the guys who who was uh, responsible um, played as Igor the Wizard, E-G-O-R the Wizard, Andrew Glaster. He runs Microsoft's Redmond facility now, I think. I mean, so we have got some MUD graduates who went on, but um, you wouldn't say that the UK games industry really owed much to mud. Um, people had played them, played mud, but, and it's like some people today who work in MMOs didn't start off on muds. They started off on Scepter of Goth. About three of them started on Avatar. Um, there's uh, one or two were from Habitat. Um, probably some Kesmai people, but not many. Mainly Scepter of Goth would, would be the one behind mud. But you can't really say that today's MMOs are what they are because of Scepter of Goth, just because of the way all of history unfolded. So, yeah, some people who played MUD did go on to develop games, but I can't say that they developed, that the UK games industry is beholden to MUD in any way, no. So, it's getting dark here, by yeah. the way. So, yeah, um, we need to... Uh, finish this yes up, yes just a couple so, of quick questions and then uh, okay quick questions this ought to be just I, real quick. I look terribly red oh no maybe i should put the light <laughs> go oh dear people are gonna think i was scarlet fever well just a couple, <laughs> couple of quick yeah. last okay. minute things i wanted to clear right. up okay uh, so I, i've heard you mentioned a couple of times that the plato stuff had no connections whatsoever to, to mud is that true yes um plato was a walled garden um because you could own it was it had special way ahead of its time vector graphics. Um, there are some Plato revisionists who like to think that Plato did have an effect on mud and or muds to come with, but no. Um, the the way I explain this to my students, golf was invented in China. There's pictures of people playing well, hitting balls into a hole with a stick from the Ming Dynasty. It was also invented 
in Holland, where it was called Kolf. It was also invented in um, England and Ireland. Depending on how far back you want to go, it was invented in ancient Rome and um, ancient Greece and ancient Egypt. Although some of the things you look at and you think, yeah, that's not golf, that's hockey. But pretty well, hitting a ball into a hole with a stick is not um, an original idea. It was always going to be invented multiple times. Same with MMOs, virtual world. They were always going to be invented mul mul multiple times. If you track back from the current game of golf, though, you will end up in Scotland. Today's golf is descended from Scottish golf. It's nothing to do with um, China. If Even if China was invented, golf was invented 300 years before the Scottish one, it didn't somehow make its way down the Silk Road and go to Scotland. No, hitting a ball in a hole with a stick is something you will get more than once. It's like that with MMOs. Now, um, as far as I know, there, are, there was Mud, Avatar, Scepter of Goth, Island of Kesmai, Habitat, and uh, much later a game called Monster by Rich Screnter at Northwestern University. Those are the six occasions that I know of that MMOs were invented independently without any of us knowing about any of the others. It, it's not an act of genius to think of an MMO. I am a genius, but that's not, not evidence of it. So um, when you look at timelines and people saying, well, you know, maybe Avatar... Avatar was maybe after MUD, but some of the other ones before Avatar, they were kind of like MUDs and, and, and like all thank that. So it predates it. Well, it doesn't matter whether it predates it. If you want to change the definition of what an MMO is to include that, well, that's your prerogative. But being earlier doesn't mean that in any way dis today's descends from it. And any, just like they don't descend from, uh, golf doesn't descend from the golf in China. Scepter of Goth does have its own thread. Mythic um, was, um, you know, Mark Jacobs, that comes out of Scepter of Goth. That one there, yes, that's made it all the way through. I would accept Scepter of Goth has had an influence on the modern MMOs. Nowhere near as much as MUDs, but it, nevertheless, it's there. Um, also, um, there are, I mean, people, um, I suppose the, the main, well... There, there are people in senior positions, Gordon Walton's the, the biggest name, who played Avatar on um, Plato. So some Avatar, some of Plato's DNA, if you like, maybe made it through from Gordon. But you couldn't say that Crowfall is anything to do with Avatar because it's mainly come out of, out of mud traditions. And the, um, the, the other guy... Crowfall is uh, he, he's an exceptional goth person, but still he probably thinks Crowfall is going to be it's it's, it's out of mud really. Um, so um, if you're think, thinking of timelines, um, yeah, Scepter of Goth might have predated mud, might have been about the same time. Doesn't really matter. Um, when when you talk about pedigrees, like um, my grandfather was probably born before your grandfather, doesn't mean you're descended from my grandfather. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, so um, some things from Avatar really did make, a, not Avatar, Plato really did make a difference, you know, things like um, mouse, the mouse stuff came out of, well, Xerox Park, but, you know, it was, um, and, and some games, um, the the 3D worlds, um, I think there was one called Wizardry or something, which was had quite an effect and that came out of Plato, and that sort of kicks out a lot of 3D worlds. So you could, if you really wanted to, I suppose, argue that the, the 3D dimension of MMOs might be able to track back to avatars, but the MMO-ness of it, you know, the virtual worldliness of it, doesn't track back to avatar. If you, if you want to look at parents following a particular line, and the line being virtual worldliness, then you're going to end up at mud possibly Scepter of Goth, and um, maybe, maybe a Kesmai. Um, okay, next question. Oh dear, I'm like a, it's like I'm suntanned. Uh, so I got here that you had, you had never played Colossal Cave Resort before you met Trubshaw, right? And he yes. introduced you to it? 
I'd never played Colossal Cave. I had read a transcript of it in a Postal Games magazine, but I'd never played it, no. Um, he showed me that. Um, Zork, or Dungeon, it was as mm-hmm. it was known to us. Um, I didn't play that until after Mud, um, quite some time after Mud. In fact, I've never finished it. I've only ever played it, like, getting into the house and down and stuff. That's so, where um, the multi-user dungeon name comes from, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. The D come because we... Um, we weren't trying to make a multi-user Zork. Um, we were trying to get across the idea that the world we w- that we made was... It, it, we wanted a name that captured what it was like so that people would understand it. And so we're saying it's, it's like a multi-user version of Dungeon. Um, in fact, it was only like it in the interface. The interface... Um, the text interface which itself was pretty obvious because that's how you communicated with computers in those days it was a command line interface so it was always going to be like that it was, there was no other option so um uh but the idea of you know it's like a, a fantasy thing you could well or that you tell things to do through commands um we figured people knew well roy figured because i didn't name it um, he figured people would know the name, uh, would know what um, Dungeon was, and we'd call this a, like a multi-user version of Dungeon, so that they'd be able to be able to get their head around it. And and once they started, they'd kind of know what to do. But it wasn't in the, it was it, it wasn't just a. You couldn't say that it was a descendant of. Um, um, adventure or advent as we called it and you, or dungeon or, or zork as it's really known uh, it, it means there was influence from it in the way that it was implemented um, but the the ideas I mean Lord of the Rings probably had much more of an impact because that showed you you could have a virtual you could have a um, an imaginary world fully realized as if it were real treated as if it was real and that's that was inspirational because it, it was a proof of concept but it wasn't um you know if you're trying trying to track back the, the mud is kind of w- where it started we didn't um, base it on anything we just made it from scratch because we had a purpose and that's all for this week's episode Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a review episode. I still haven't decided uh, what game I will be looking at yet, so if you have something that you'd really like to see on the show, please let me hear all of your suggestions. Kind of leaning toward a little game called Arx Fatalis at the moment, so let me know what you think about that. Always like to hear your opinions, and as always, thank you very, 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 very much, guys, for your support of Matt Chat. means the world to me. You have no idea, so thank you very much. And uh, if you have not supported the show yet but would like to, just go to the link in the show notes for the Patreon site. You could sign up for any amount of money you think the show is worth to you. So thank you guys very, very much. Now what about that? News from the Matt Cave. All right, so quite a bit of uh, fun news. Uh, first up, uh, Shane Stacks, a friend of the show, uh, hosts the MattChat.us website. Uh, by the way, I don't know if I... I don't mention that a lot. I don't really update it all that much, but uh, that's usually where I will post uh, audio podcasts and things. So uh, go check that out. Uh, he's got a, uh interview on his show, Shane Plays. He does a terrestrial radio show, and he's got uh, Joe and Hannah from uh, Serpent in the Staglands. Uh, game on there. So I thought I would pass that along. I'll put the link in the show notes if you want to hear some more from Joe and Hannah. Great guests. Uh, Also, let's see who sent this in. Uh, I'm not sure who sent this in. I thought it was, I think this might have been Adam. Uh, Hairbrain Studios is has an announcing, I don't think they've gone live with this yet, but they're planning a Kickstarter for Battletech. And uh, this is an RPG series. I used to play one, I think it's called Battletech Crescent Hawk Inception on my Amiga. Really, really like that game. Apparently, they're trying to bring something back like that. Uh, I haven't really delved into this too deeply, but it 
you know, let me know if you know more about it, but it's a turn-based tactical RPG uh, sounding game. So it looked really good. Definitely caught my eye. Uh, Thamer wrote in about a new trailer for Tangiers. I think's the way you pronounce that. It's the quote-unquote strangest stealth game you've ever seen. And if you watch that trailer, <laughs> I think you'll agree it is quite strange. I saw a dude in that trailer with the head of a cassette tape. So I guess that's sort of the ultimate tape head. I uh, no idea about that game, but Thamer thought it was interesting. Definitely worth a look. It's only two minutes long. And then uh, Robbie wrote in about, uh, I think maybe a couple of you guys wrote in about this. Albion is on GOG now. It's a $5.99. I'll put a link in the show notes as my partner code or affiliate code on there, so I'll get a little kickback if you uh, decide to buy that game. You might remember I reviewed that. It's probably been... Shoot, it's probably been years now since I reviewed that game, but really definitely uh, definitely worth checking out. If you don't know about the game, just watch the Matt Chat, and then you can make a decision. And then finally, uh, actually, I think that's all the news. <laughs> so anyway, uh, what about that Eel of the Week? All right, so this week I've got a little number. I actually got a variety pack. They had it on sale of uh, the Stone. Uh, selections. This is a Stone's go-to IBA, uh, IPA, rather, a vibrant hop-bursted session IPA. Uh, let's see. And these guys are, I believe, what out of Colorado? No, 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 San Diego, California. Oh, okay. Yeah, San Diego County, California. I guess they're from a place called Escondido Stone Brewing Company. Uh, big write-up here. Uh, one thing I did notice was that it's 4.5% uh, alcohol, which is very, you know, it's definitely on the low end of alcohol. Uh, I think that might, might be less even than a Budweiser, maybe somewhere around Bud Light level. Uh, so I guess that's why they call it go-to IPA. You could probably just go to this one <laughs> and drink, you know, a six-pack and I have to worry about uh, embarrassment. Let's see, Stone, I'm not going to read this long thing, maybe just the last piece here. Sit back and go to with your new everyday go-to IPA and bask along with us in the glory of the almighty hop. So apparently this will be quite hoppy. But anyway, let's, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this go-to IPA here in this rather excellent drinking horn. <sighs> been... I've been smelling this. It's uh, actually quite aromatic. It's very citrusy. Uh, it almost smells lemony, orangey. Uh, just a really strong citrus uh, smell. You definitely smell the hops in it as well. Well, just you know, it smells really nice. You don't really taste any uh, or smell any alcohol fumes at all, uh, which isn't really that surprising considering it's uh, sort of low on the alcohol content uh, scale. But let's give it a taste. You know, it's quite nice. You get a little bit of bitterness uh, going down, but that sort of fades away. And then you get the sort of malty, uh, hoppy, a little bit of a sort of a piney-like taste in there. It's, uh, it's actually quite good. Uh, it's not bad at all. I'll try it again. I just, I mean, there's a lot of flavor here. If you like that sort of malty, or um, I'm, I'm sorry, a hoppy, I uh, like flavor to this as you'd get with an IPA, but you don't want the, a lot of IPAs will have a lot of, high alcohol. And so if you want one of those, if you like that flavor but you don't want that strong alcohol, I think this would be a very good choice. I'll try it one more time here. Yeah, you know, it's, it's not bad at all. Uh, I think what I would say for this is if you <laughs> like the taste of an IPA but you don't like the alcohol, this would be a very good choice. If you want something with a bit more kick to it, obviously you would look elsewhere. Uh, but flavor-wise, uh, flavor this is quite nice. I'm going to go uh, four out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, Go-to IPA from Stone. It's quite nice. All right, so I want to wrap this up with a quotation. And I was uh, looking for quotations about reading. And I found a really good quote. I really love this one. It's uh, from Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> I assume you probably know who that is. Anyway, it goes something like this. Either write something worth reading or do something worth writing. See you guys next week.
I consider it an insult to my backside that it was forced <laughs> to sit here growing carbuncles through such putrid adolescent slush. 